Thanks very much, Corinne, and welcome everyone. Uh, great to see so many of you here today. I think this was, must be one of the biggest deep dives that we're, that we're doing. So you might win on, on that front. Um, just can we move on one, James? James, oh, thank you. So we've got a few slides here to run through, which we hope will take about 20 to 25 minutes, leaving plenty of time for questions and answers at the end. It's roughly split into three sections. The first is around our recommended path and the overarching analysis and key messages across the economy as a whole. Then we'll have a few more detailed slides on agriculture and land use. And then Mike will run through a few slides on the waste sector. So if we can move on. Thanks, James. And then the next one. So this is one of the key slides which shows our approach to the analysis for the sixth carbon budget. And what we did is we de developed three exploratory scenarios, which are shown here in grey. And these span on one, one axis how far we think we can go on, on innovation and R&D, and on the other on how far we can go on behaviour change. So the widespread engagement scenario is, is one in which people and businesses are more likely to take action on behaviour change. And so, so that sits on, on the high end of that axis. And wi widespread innovation, as, as the name suggests, is where innovation leads to cost reductions for many technologies. For example, cheap power, which flows through the economy in different ways. Headwinds is where progress is more heavy going and we need to make more use of infrastructure there's more hydrogen use in this, in this scenario, particularly for buildings and transport. And tail, tailwinds is an optimistic take on what could happen if things go well on both of these fronts. So it's exploring max, maximum feasible potential, but not necessarily what we think will happen. So if we go through uh, one more, thanks James. So our balanced pathway cuts across all of these scenarios. And in this pathway, we assess what actions are needed across all sectors to take a balanced view of what can be achieved. And this brings together a lot of bottom, uh, detailed bottom-up analysis across all, all emitting sectors of the economy. It aims to keep open options from the other exploratory scenarios. And what's crucial about the balanced pathway is we think it's feasible, and we use this pathway to make our recommendations. Next one, please, James. So the balanced pathway is also consistent with climate science and what's happening internationally. It's consistent with the Paris um, ambition and keeps up open the 1.5 degree ambition open. It delivers early action, which is important because this determines cumulative emissions, which drive climate outcomes. It results in UK per capita emissions <clears throat> by 2035, which are consistent with global pathways to one and a half degrees. It shows clear leadership um, and supports raising global ambition, which is needed in the run up to the UK's presidency of COP next year. And we think it's a fair contribution in, in the context of global emissions reduction. It sees UK taking action earlier than required in, in many of the global pathways to keep warming below one and a half degrees. Okay, next slide please, James, and the next one. So what are we actually recommending? This shows the path of, of emissions to net zero with the six carbon budget period shown here as the purple bar. And the headline here is that we need to cut emissions by 78% by 2035 on 1990 levels, which in effect brings forward the previous 80% target by nearly 15 years. And you notice that the path is front loaded, it's an inverted S shape, which means that more action is taking at the beginning of the period than at, at, the, later, at the later period. So 60% of the reduction is in the first 15 years from now, with 40% in the following 15 years. And this is really important for investment because most of the investment needs to take place in the next 15 years. And the fact that it's front loaded means that we leave open opportunities in the exploratory scenarios if we need them later. It's also important to note that it includes emissions from international aviation and shipping and from peatlands. In terms of our recommendation on the uh, UK's nationally determined contribution, 
we've recommended uh, um, a reduction of 68% in 2030, and that excludes international aviation and shipping in line with U UN convention. But that's not to say that we don't think um, this sector should be ignored. We also need to pursue abatement um, options in, in all of the sectors. And we're very pleased that the government has, has now announced this level as its NDC. Next slide, please, James. So this, this slide really just summarizes the committee's key recommendations. So we've just been through the budget level and the, uh, the 2030 NDC. In terms of the budget scope, um, we, we think that budgets should cover all greenhouse gases, as I've just mentioned, including international aviation and shipping and peatlands. In terms of domestic action versus credits, performance should be based on domestic action with credits only being used when these go beyond the, the budget level that we're recommending. And it, we think it should be legislated as, as soon as possible to give clarity and certainty to business and to put in pleasures the wide range of measures that we need to deliver it. This is really important for the, the next few years and, and the next decade. And lastly, we don't think we need to change existing budgets because the NDC and the six carbon budget supersede these. So those are the key messages for the economy wide um, bit of the report. We'll now move on to a summary of the, of the picture for what this means for agriculture and land use. So next slide, please, James. So this is one of the key slides that summarizes what the six carbon budget means for land use. For those of you familiar with our previous work, the analytical approach that we're adopting in, the, in this report is, is very similar, but we're, we're updating a lot of the evidence and assumptions compared with our net zero report. So what we do is we look at how land is used now and consider how this needs to change in the future to both maintain per capita food production in line with the growing population, deliver deep emissions reduction and also achieve other environmental objectives. And the headline is, result is that we need, is that around a third of land is freed up through productivity improvements and consumer behaviour change. And we need to use around 21% of this for actions to sequester and reduce carbon. So on the right hand side chart, we see an increase in uses that, that basically sequester carbon and a reduction in, in areas associated with, with traditional um, agricultural uses on, cro on cropland and grassland. So land for forestry, agroforestry and bioenergy crops increases from around 15% currently to 25% by 2050. And there's a corresponding reduction in cropland and grassland. Cropland goes from 20% now to about 17% by 2050. And grassland from over just over 50% now to 31% by 2050. So that's quite a, a big change. There's also a big increase in natural peatlands with nearly 80% of peatlands restored by 2050. So next slide, please, James. So this shows how we can achieve this transformation and looks at measures, measures that release land. In, in the balanced pathway, we nearly 4 million hectares uh, of, of land are released by 2035 and 6 million by 2050. And a negative value on this chart reflects lands that land is that's released from agriculture and a positive land that's required. And the, the bottom bar here um, <clears throat> illustrates the additional land needed to maintain food production in, in the light of um, a growing population and also settlement growth demand. In terms of the measures that release land, diet chains has by far the biggest impact. So this is around four times higher than the next biggest measure. And in, in the balanced pathway, we have a 20% reduction in meat by 2030, rising to 35% by 2050. The other measures such as crop yields, um, food waste reduction and increasing livestock stocking rates have very similar impacts by 2035. And moving horticulture indoors has very little impact on, on land released. You can bar barely notice it in this chart. But it's, we thought it's important to include to demonstrate the feasibility of this as an option and also that it could have a larger impact if emissions, if horticulture 
crops are, are moved from, from peatlands where that they're often grown. So I'll hand over now for Indra to take you through the remaining land use slides. Uh, next slide, please, James. Yes. So what I'm going to do now, the next set of results are going to show you the emissions results under the balance pathway and also the other scenarios. So firstly, looking at agriculture. So we can see in 2018, emissions stood at close to 55 megatons. And under the balance pathway, we see this falling by 28% to 39 megatons by 2035 and by 36% by 2050. So by, so next slide. So in terms of the emission savings compared to the business as usual, abatement is 13 megatons in 2035. So those are the annual savings. So this chart, chart on the right shows you how that 13 megaton, megatons is split across the main abatement chunks. And you can see the purple wedge, which is diet change and food waste reduction gives you by far the largest reduction. And most of that actually is diet change. So it's the 20% by 2030 rising to 35% uh, by 2050. The orange chunk is the low carbon practices. So these are the take up of measures that farmers can deploy on farm to reduce non-CO2 emissions from livestock, soils and crops and waste management. And by 2035, the take up can deliver four megatons of savings in that year. Um, the, the abatement potential of these low carbon farming practices takes account of the change in agricultural area and livestock numbers from the land release measures. So for example, with diet change, you will have a reduction in land area, but also livestock numbers. So what that does, it reduces the abatement potential from the take up of low carbon farming practices. So next slide, please. So the this slide here shows you the agricultural pathways under the different scenarios. So you can see that the emission savings by 2035 ranges between nine megatons under the least, ambition, least ambitious headwind scenario, uh, rising to 19 megatons worth of savings under the um, innovation, innovation scenario. So residual emissions fall by uh, between 30 and 56% by 2050 compared to 2018. And again, if we look at the key differences as what, ex what explains the differences in this level of abatement, under the headwinds, we've got less ambition on diet change. So we've got a 20% reduction in meat and dairy production by 2050, compared to the balanced pathway of a 35% reduction for meat consumption by 2050. And under the innovation and wider engagement scenarios, we have a much higher level of diet change. So a 50% reduction by 2050. So that drives a lot of the uh, differences in, in abatement in those particular scenarios. Also in the innovation scenario, we have a higher level or the highest level of um, crop yield improvement, sustainable crop yield improvement. So what that does, it releases more cropland compared to the balance pathway. So you see a corresponding reduction in agricultural emissions there. We can go to the next slide, please. So turning our attention to the land use sector, um, current emissions in 2018 stood at um, close to 13 megatons. So the sector's a net source. This is if we include all sources of peatland emissions. But under our balance pathway, we see these emissions falling by 93% to around one megaton by 2035. And by 2050, it reverses to a net sink close to 20 megatons. So um, by 20, 2035, annual net savings compared to the business as usual is around 13 megatons. And the chart on the right shows you how that 13 megatons is split across the main um, abatement uh, uh, opportunities. So what are the land-based opportunities there? So you can see afforestation is the top chunk. So that's delivering around two megatons of savings by 2035. So that's driven by afforestation rates reaching um, 30,000 hectares by 2025, and then increasing to 50,000 hectares by 2035, which is then flatlined all the way to 2050. And the second chunk there is the peatland emissions savings, which is about six megaton by 25 in 2025. 
So as ever mentioned, we see the area that's being restored rising from the current 25% to 58% 50, by 2035 and close to 80% by 2050. So we look at all types of peatland restoration there, because including uplands, lowland grassland, and lowland cropland. Within lowland cropland, we're re-wetting 40% um, of lowland cropland area by 2050, and it's either being re-wetted to near natural condition, or it's actually re-wetted um, to a polluted culture type system. So that's a wetland type system where you can grow crops in waterlogged conditions. And we also incorporate savings from lowland cropland sustainable management options. So this is where conventional agriculture is, is, is remains. So you're still growing the same type of crops as currently, but you're actually managing the water table better, which allows you to actually reduce emissions from this cropland. And also another key um, abatement measure we have is the planting of energy crops. So this includes the perennial energy crops of SRC, miscanthus and short rotation, short rotation forestry. So planting rates for these products reach 30,000 hectares by 2035 and by 2050, the area increases to 0.7 million hectares. We go to the next slide, please. So this next slide shows you um, the land use sector under the alternative pathways. So you can see that under the most ambitious pathways, widespread innovation and tailwinds, the net sink is reached by 2035. And by 2050s, all scenarios are net sinks ranging between 12 to 38 megatons. Um, so what's driving the changes in these savings? Well, we, one of the key differences is the level of afforestation rates. So under the wider engagement, we've got the highest level of afforestation, which reaches 70,000 hectares by 2035. But this type of afforestation under the wide, widespread engagement is sort of driven by more diverse, more um, uh, biodiversity. So it's got a higher broadleaf mix um, compared to conifers, whereas an innovation scenario where sort of focused more on planting more conifers that have higher yields as well. And a key, another key difference is the level of energy crop planting. So in the innovation scenario, we have doubled the area of energy crop planting than we do under the balance pathway. So that's a key driver of the high level of, of abatement savings in, in that particular scenario. If we go to the next slide, please. So putting, putting those two sectors together, this is the combined level of emissions, residual emissions, um, under the different scenarios by 2050. And we can see if we look at the balanced, um, the balanced uh, pathway there, that emissions from those two sectors fall to 16 megatons. And looking at the alternative scenarios, the range there is between 26. And under the most ambitious scenarios of tailwinds and innovation, it's actually reaches um, less than zero. So, 14 megatons there under the tailwinds. We go to the next slide, please. So what does this mean in terms of the amount of capex, capital investment that's needed to deliver um, both the agricultural uh, abatement and also the land use sequestration? So we estimate that the balance pathway would require net investment of 1.5 billion in 2035. So again, this is the, the capital investment required. And how that splits out is most of that is actually from the land, um, the land based measures, and a much smaller part of it is to do with the, the take up of low carbon farming practices. Uh, woodland creation and energy crops are by far the, the most significant costs. So they account for a considerable chunk there, as you can see from the, the two bottom wedges. So that's the uh, capex needed, but we also try to estimate what that means in terms of the, the environmental and wider social benefits that our balanced pathway could deliver. And we estimate that this is roughly around uh, 0.1 billion pounds in 2035, rising to 0.6 billion by 2050. So we weren't able to quantify all environmental benefits. It wasn't possible for us to quantify the biodiversity benefits and the, the water quality improvement benefits you would get. 
um, but of the uh, benefits we were able to quantify, by far the largest was the recreational benefits, and this accounted for about 74%. Um, if we can go to the next slide, please. So in terms of the uh, key recommendations, so we, we've got three reports um, that were released last year. One report is our sort of focuses more on the policy recommendations that's needed. And um, more detail is actually given in our January land use report. But these are the key recommendations that we, we've highlighted for the six carbon budget. So these concern the strengthening of the regulatory baseline to ensure that low regret measures are taken up. So this talks about you know, the need to retain and extend existing environmental legislation that has actually you know, been good for reducing agricultural emissions. So cross-compliance rules, for example, you know, retaining uh, nitrate vulnerable zones and extending them where possible. Um, and also banning you know, damaging practices on peat, so whether that's rotational burning or peat extraction or horticultural use. So we've called for an immediate ban on rotational burning. The second key feature is the need to provide funding to ensure that these me measures are taken up. So that consists both you know, the provision of public subsidy, whether that's through the ELM system that's going to be rolled out shortly, um, or you know, the development of a private mechanism to encourage afforestation rates, which could be delivered through some sort of trading scheme or auction contracts. And I note that the Forestry Commission and DEFRA published the details of their third woodland creation auction yesterday. So that's a sort of system where they're trying to encourage private and sector investment in planting more trees. Thirdly, so that's the, that's the financial side, but we also um, recognise that there's a whole host of non-financial barriers that's stopping willing participants with the money there to take up some measures. And um, you know, there's a considerable range of non-financial barriers, some of them we cite there. So we need more skills and knowledge. You know, ensuring farmers have the information to be able to know what to do with their land, um, scaling up the forestry supply chain and resolving tenancy issues on farm. So, you know, some circumstances, uh, tenants might be willing, but the terms of their contract might prohibit them from changing the use of their land. Um, we also, given that ELMS isn't actually going to be rolled out until 2024, we have to ensure that there is a set of interim policies and funding in place so that we avoid a hiatus in action. Many of our measures, um, you know, such as afforestation, for example, has to get started now, given the long time profile before they start sequestering a significant amount of carbon. So it's important that we have, you know, a set of policies in place as soon as possible to avoid this hiatus. Um, looking at the, the sort of the demand side, so the diets and the uh, reducing food waste, so what we've asked for is that there has to be an evidence-based strategy that consists of providing information to consumers that, and that enables them to actually, you know, to give them more information so that they can make informed choices as to the sort of products they're making. So that could include, you know, more carbon labeling in supermarkets, for example, and also a widespread campaign to make them aware of the climate and also health impacts of the food choices that they make. And in terms of reducing food waste, we've called for mandatory separate food waste collection, you know, as, as is currently the case in Wales. And lastly, uh, for our policy recommendation, there has to be an, uh, a need for a very strong monitoring, reporting and verification system. Very crucial, you know, if we're giving out public money under the ELM scheme for the delivery of actions. So we've got to be able to monitor, you know, what these actions are actually delivering. And at the same time, where there is regulation in place, we've got to ensure that the bodies responsible for enforcement are properly resourced. So that concludes the agriculture and land use sector. Great, then um, I'll just present a brief overview of our analysis on waste then. Uh, thanks, James, if you can just move on to the next slide. So I think, for, first of all, just worth reminding ourselves that uh, waste is still a fairly significant proportion of the UK's emissions. It's about 6% of today's emissions, um, although it has reduced about 60% since 1990. And that's largely uh, by avoiding waste going to landfill. So it has, has been a success story to date. But what we're recognising here is 
there, there are significant opportunities to reduce waste emissions even further. And we're suggesting around 75% reductions in the balanced pathway. And you can see the sources of those reductions in the chart on the left-hand side here. And then what the chart on the right-hand side shows is uh, the variation in emissions pathways across the scenarios uh, for waste in our analysis. But just to highlight on the left-hand side where we see these emissions reductions coming from, um, well, first of all, highlighting the uh, avoiding waste is a big driver throughout here. So you'll see that's important in the early 2020s in avoiding waste going to energy from waste plants. And, and that's the big yellow slice, um, which extends out to 2050 there. So that's, that's really materially important there. Um, and, but also avoiding waste going to landfill. That's the top, that's the top chunk there. And, and there we think we can actually probably ban all waste going to landfill by either 2030 or 2040. Um, and avoid particularly biodegradable waste going to landfill, which produces the majority of methane at, the, at those sites, uh, which is a particularly potent greenhouse gas. And then lastly, just that bottom chunk you see on the left-hand chart is um, energy from waste plants, uh, fitting carbon capture and storage. Uh, to date, energy from waste has been quite a low carbon means of producing energy in the UK. Uh, producing electricity but what we're, what we're saying here is that actually by 2050 in a net zero world it, it's not comparatively low carbon enough compared to all the other options that you have out there for really clean electricity um, so that people should be should be thinking about retrofitting carbon capture and storage onto existing energy from waste facilities and any new energy from waste facilities should be built with carbon capture and storage in mind as well so we so we can ensure it's a genuine near zero carbon source of energy by 2050. Uh, James, if you could just move on to the next one. Thank you. Uh, we, we are recognizing there's, there's some costs here. Um, and, and actually, it's a quite a strange investment pattern for, for the waste sector. Uh, there's some additional investment in the 2020s, particularly in wastewater treatment. Um, it's about £400 million a year there in wastewater treatment plants. Uh, if you think the total, the UK probably spends around £12 billion a year on water overall. So it, this is a small additional investment into uh, reducing emissions from wastewater treatment in the 2020s. And there are some operational savings separately from that from uh, improved recycling as well. And then what you see is um, some substantial costs from 2040 onwards as existing uh, energy from waste plant fit carbon capture and storage facilities as well, which will be quite a material cost. And I think there's recognition there that government will need to bring forward business models for these energy from waste facilities to ensure that, that can happen. Just moving on to the, to the last waste slide then, please, James. Um, what, what, are our, what are our key recommendations here? So a, a focus on increasing um, waste, pre waste prevention and uh, re reuse and recycling as well, um, particularly for food waste. Um, that's things like what Indra mentioned, so uh, in enabling households to, to recycle food waste wherever possible. As, as well as mandatory business food waste reporting. Um, more ambitious recycling targets. We're recognizing that some um, the devolved administrations, particularly Wales and Scotland, have quite ambitious recycling targets already, but England and Northern Ireland have got some catching up to do. And all of them can probably go further beyond 2030 as well. Uh, we think we can ban biodegradable waste from, land, from going to landfill by as early as 2025. And that's gonna lead to a material reduction in emissions there. Um, and beyond that, we think we could probably ban all waste from going to landfill and ban the export of waste from the UK as well between 2030 and 2040. Uh, we're re recognizing that we can reduce emissions to, associated with wastewater treatment as well, and, and suggesting that the regulator off what really take, take that into its, its mandate when it, when it considers the net zero goal there. And then lastly, as, as I mentioned, en energy from waste is actually quite a growing source of emissions in the UK at the moment, and there's a lot of new there's a lot of plans from local authorities for new energy from waste facilities we, th we think fairly ur urgent action and guidance needs to be taken there and provided from government noting that these actually are quite high emission sources of energy uh, in the very long run so that will need to be addressed as well thank you